Hello and welcome to Revision Tips for SIPS Level 5 Advanced Diploma in Procurement and Supply. This is Module 15, Advanced Negotiation, Learning Outcome 3, which is to understand methods and behaviour factors which can influence others. So we'll look at those influences on individuals and groups, the behavioural factors that influence individuals. And we'll start with building networks of trust and influence. So an awareness of influencing style of a person or an organisation is key to building successful alliances and partnerships within your supply chain. So it's necessary to use the right influence style to suit the influence and challenge. This can be learned in theory, such as with the brain approach, which you can see on the screen, but it mainly develops through practice. Influencing styles is a combination of our own interests and inherent personal traits, the use of tools to help us discover our preferred approach, other helpful approaches from company culture, and approaches from work and life experience. But common styles of influence include bridging, that's using sort of push and pull styles, rationalizing, which is a push style, asserting, again, another push style, or inspiring, which is actually a pull style, or negotiating, which is a pull style. So push styles are good for gaining compliance and pull styles are good for winning hearts and minds. Yuki and his colleagues identified selecting influencing tactics that can be deployed to influence groups. So hard tactics are usually deployed by simply building on an individual's inherent bias. They include things like coalition, legitimizing and pressuring. Soft tactics are more complex and require the ability to influence others based on their perspectives, which helps to build rapport. The need to understand inner motivation is stronger in the use of soft tactics. So they include things like rational persuasion, consultation, apprising and exchange. And the impact and influence can only really be judged by the extent to which outcome was achieved. So network building involves the professional interacting with others and establishing a network of coordinating relationships as well as cooperative relationships. And the characteristics of these networks is that they're found outside the formal structure of a company. And they're often a considerable in size and include people outside your organization. They can help establish and maintain contacts that could assist in the successful achievement of the actions in the agenda setting. And the procurement leads can build these networks of influence and extend them to suppliers and markets. And the networks can enable the canvassing of opinions and knowledge in informal but potentially agenda changing ways. Now in procurement, a good partner will possess any or all of the following characteristics a willingness to take risks or to make change to their organization, ability to think in the long term about profit and income, understanding the importance of investing in research and development and the willingness to share intellectual property rights and information, recognizing the potential benefits. It's more likely that the correct appraisal of these factors will emerge after some experience of dealing with a particular supplier rather than through a competitive bidding process for product quality or supply. There may be only one or two good partnerships in the whole business over the number of years, as they require significant time investment and high levels of skill in procurement and stakeholder teams. A partnership is often underpinned by a legal commitment, whereas a strategic alliance is generally not a legal entity. So characteristics of strategic alliance will include a commercial relationship between two or more parties. The parties' respective assets expertise are shared in order to pursue a set of agreed objectives. Each organisation remains independent. These strategic alliances can develop out of outsourced relationships and the desire to develop and innovate through mutually defined benefits or synergies. They may last for a specific or ind indefinite period of time. They work best when the company's portfolios complement each other, but do not directly compete. So the advantages is that you share the risk and knowledge, there's an opportunity for growth and a speed to market. 
But the downside, of course, is that there could be breach of confidentiality, uneven alliances and opportunity costs. Now, conflict is inevitable. And in 2007, Mullins identified the following sources of conflict. That happens in teamwork. A difference of perception, limited resources, specialisation or interdependence, role conflict, inequitable treatment, a violation of territory or some external change, like a change in the economy. Good management and mitigating processes can reduce the negative impact that conflict has on teams and outputs. So you should be familiar with the Thomas Kilman instrument. It's used to understand conflict resolution behaviours and it categorises behaviours on two scales, assertiveness and cooperativeness. And there are five conflict resolution behaviours. Competing, which is where you're being assertive and caring about your own outcomes and not theirs. Um, or you could be cooperative. I suppose you're accommodating at this point where you're more, you're more willing to give them what they're looking for, but not satisfy your own needs. You could be avoiding where you're neither satisfying yours or theirs, but you're sweeping it under the carpet. Collaborating or compromising is where you strike a balance between assertiveness and cooperation. But important points to note about that is that all five of the behaviours are useful in some situation. It's better to be flexible in using all five than stick rigidly to one style. Although most people have dealt, have, have a default behaviour, of course. But the effectiveness of this approach depends on the requirement for the specific conflict solution and the personalities of the individuals involved. So if, it's worth noting when considering conflict management and resolution the successful conflict resolution is achieved by adequately addressing each side's needs so that all sides are satisfied with the outcome. And unless the group is self-managing, it's the role of the leader or facilitator to encourage the team to reach an agreement. Conflict resolution approach is aimed to end conflict before they start. And it may minimise the areas of discord, but never actually resolve the problem. So the conflict is managed rather than resolved. And conflict resolution should be a long-term aim. Procurement professionals need, the, need to possess some skills, like the ability to deal with the degree of change in a marketplace, a mix of hard and soft skills in law and finance, soft skills in persuasion and stakeholder management, and the ability to deal with potentially unsettling, challenging certainty and amb amb ambiguity. Procurement is an ideal role for people who thrive on managing change and dealing with variety. And the change curve that was developed in 1969 by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross has five stages, starting with denial, moving into anger, bargaining, depression and acceptance. It shows how change can result in things like ambiguity, uncertainty and loss of performance. But once the change has been normalised and absorbed, the subsequent level of performance is higher than it was before. The change curve also indicates the influence in behaviours and coaching styles to ensure teams do not lose heart in the midst of ambiguity and uncertainty, which could be used at various stages in the curve. So the influence in behaviours and coaching styles will be things like listening, supporting, providing direction, discussing and learning, negotiation and influencing, should be used at all stages of the procurement cycle, before a contract, during a contract, as well as after a contract. And some critical points of change for ensuring that continued performance with a supplier is that during the loss of a contract or a change in corporate direction, you need to think about how the business continues to function while the new supplier prepares to take over. The, pe the period post-contract placement where new relationships are being formed and KPIs are being embedded. And while setting the course of new teams where a contract launch event can be beneficial. It's commonly understood that business performance is a combination of the company culture, 
the leadership and individual. And these three factors work in harmony or in tension and provide the interaction that gives outstanding performance, inadequate performance, or even failure. So the guiding principle outlined before is that negotiation behavior breeds behavior. So if the negotiator sets the tone by being confrontational and pushy and interrupting, then no matter how much the supplier resolves not to, they will probably adopt a similar tone. <laughs> this can be seen in political interviews on television where an aggressive questioner elicits an aggressive response and a more considerate interviewer may get a more considered response. It's also true on the football field where an aggressive team will often have to be met with aggression or they will overrun their competitors. And there are many tools and techniques that HR professionals and coaches can use to uncover person's attributes, like the motivations in certain circumstances, the attitudes and responses exhibited under stress. And here we can see the Myers-Briggs type indicator or MBTI. It's derived from a self-report questionnaire and it assesses the way an individual experiences the world and which personality type is dominant for a person most of the time using four principled psychological functions, sensation, intuition, feeling or thinking. No one person type is shown as preferable in negotiation situations all types in balance can bring benefits. Then the big five personality traits, also known as the five factor model. It means understanding personality traits. The mnemonic ocean can be remembered for the traits. Openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness or neuroticism. And using the insights discovery will can bring about self-awareness. By demonstrating the importance of individual skill sets, skill sets and how they can work together, the insights discovery will can have an impact on things like teamwork, employee engagement, leader development, service and change management. The outcomes are represented in a four color model that helps people to understand their color and strength in the value they bring to the team. The cool blues, the earth greens, the sunshine yellows and the fiery reds. Each colour represents an aspect that in harmony with another can bring about a high performing team. And the Jahari window can be used to help people better understand their relationships with themselves and with others. Individuals and their peers select adjectives from a list to describe the individual. They are then categorised according to what is known to self and known to others. So you have the arena, known to self and known to others. A blind spot that's not known to, to yourself, but is known to others. The facade, which is known to self, but not to others. And the complete unknown, or the blind, as I used to call it, which isn't known to you or to others. And in the 1970s, Meredith Belbin identified nine team roles that high performing teams need to assess. So you have the resource investigator, the team worker, coordinator, the plant, monitor evaluator or specialist, implementer and completer finisher. Not every team needs nine members or all nine of these skill sets, but each team member is likely to have a primary and secondary skill set with the role definition and so can meet the team needs by planning or playing two roles. Now the further dimension under organizational structure is what's known as an informal organization. This relates to the network of social connections be between their co-workers, the alliances, friendships and associations between people that take place during work. It consists of the dynamic set of personal relationships and social networks, communities of common interests and other sources of information. 
It's often driven by the need to break away from what is seen as stifling effects of bureaucracy that are inevitably created in larger, more formal organisational structures. The informal organisation evolves from the formal organisation and it's capitalised on the informal organisation where it complements the more explicit structure, plans and processes of the formal organisation. It can enhance responses to unforeseen events or nurture innovation and enable people to solve problems by collaborating across company boundaries. It can begin to introduce ways of interacting that, if successful, can become part of the formal organisation in time. And it's been recognised over many years of research, beginning with Mary Parker, through the recent application of Skunk Works in Google X. That was an experimental lab laboratory or department in a business or the institution that is typically independent of and much smaller than the main research division of an organisation. So a skunk work project is developed by small loosely structured groups of researchers who are freed from the constraints of the formal organisation. They're able to concentrate on radically involving and innovating to bring exceptional benefits. A less radical approach is the growth around centre of excellence where specialist skills can be developed in small groups and then rolled up to the wider organisation. The best approach is to enable to integrate the formal and informal organisation, thereby setting the strengths of both types of structures and minimising the weaknesses of each other's. The style of leadership can constrain or enhance an individual style of team members. The Town of Ammon Schmidt model described a continuum of leadership according to the degree of control that is maintained. There are four main styles, from telling to selling to consulting and joining. They concluded that successful leaders have attributes such as they're both perceptive and flexible. They're aware of the forces that take place and are able to behave appropriately in understanding themselves, the individual and the groups and the situational pressures. They can use all four of the defined styles in varying situations rather than being limited to one default style. In order to enhance the performance of individuals within their team, the manager will use a range of leadership and influence and styles, like being a coach or a critical friend, a goal setter, a collaborator, a role model or a sounding board, or that guardian or facilitator. So the analysis of leadership styles can be applied to the negotiation context. Within the negotiation, procurement professionals should consider themselves, the team and the supplier. The procurement professional should also have an understanding of the skills they themselves possess as well as lack. Bear in mind that diverse teams have better long-term outcomes and use personality tools to help select the negotiation team who display different skill sets and strengths. Personality tools can again be used to build a contract delivery team where the skills from both parties are identified and can be used to accelerate the project. The area of spend affects the kind of influencing skills that should be used. This can play a part in the type of training given to an individual buyer or indeed the kind of person that is employed. Leadership style and behaviours can make or break a commercial deal. For example, a person with strong assertive behaviour is highly desirable when the aim is to drive down cost, but may well lose the deal when empathy and situational sensitivity are required. Leica identified four system management approaches to leadership. System one, an exploitive authoritative. System two, a benevolent authoritative. System three, a consultative, and system four, a participative. Now, he studied, his studies revealed that within systems one and two, the most productive departments employed management practices within systems three and four. But the least productive departments tended to employ management practices in the systems one and two. So the nearer the behavioral characteristics of the organization are, the more participant system, the more likely and pr the, pro the productivity will be and the staff retention should be high. Supportive and participative 
relationships are seen to enhance self-esteem and contribute to a sense of personal worth and importance. But the three fundamental concepts of system four, the participative management, is supportive relationships, group decision-making and high performance. In terms of consultation and participation in negotiation situations, the leadership of the negotiation team must be open to many inputs. They will drive the process and be responsible for the results they need to defer the members of the team who have specialist expertise, including consulting with stakeholders and being aware of the business environment, inviting technical experts into the team, involving suppliers to find solutions, and stakeholders and team members will more readily accept the outcome if they feel they've been contributed to the result. So the consulting and joining styles are the most effective in this situation. So procurement leaders should be using consultative and particip participatory influencing behaviour to get the best from the group and ultimately from the supplier. So straightforward negotiations will be one-to-one -one with a supplier, with the technical input having been made beforehand. Here, following the advice given before, the emphasis should be on good preparation and practice. The leadership style should be one of the empowering the junior negotiator by means of coaching and support to undertake the negotiation on their own. So attempting to distinguish clearly between empowerment and delegation is not straightforward. There seems to be a general consensus that empowerment describes a management style and the granting of genuine power to members of staff. Empowerment is viewed as an embracing approach. The act of delegation comes out of the desire to empower. So empowerment is the authority or power given to somebody to do something such as an employee being allowed greater freedom and self-control over their work. Now, formal organisational structures or designs consist of a framework whose purpose is to properly devise roles and responsibilities and streamline processes in order to achieve maximum efficiency and clarity. It does it in a number of ways. It's sort of clearly defining roles and responsibilities in order to set and meet employee expectations. Clearly defining relationships between the roles to promote effective communication between groups and to offer a clear escalation route for any issues. Clearly define the goals and tasks that need to be achieved and which ones will be responsible for delivering them. Ensuring the organisational strategy can be achieved by coordinating departmental teams and individual activities so they can support the overall goal of an organisation in the most effective way. Using coordinated systems and processes to implement and improve workflows. And maintaining levels of employment satisfaction by promoting and supporting teamwork. So the four approaches you can see on the screen, firstly, the functional approach. Here, tasks are grouped together according to their common nature. So finance, production, procurement, sales, marketing will all sit together in their own dis dis distinct function. That has all the benefits of providing the centre of expertise and specialism and everyone is clear how they th fit into the organisation and what role they fulfil. The human relation approach is where the recognition of people is a key organisational resource. It focuses attention on the aspects of organisational structure that offers greater personal employee satisfaction. So you get flatter structures and fewer layers and authority to decentralise to lower levels. Team working to fulfil social needs and create synergy of pooled skills and expertise. Cross-functional and multi-skilled working, allowing workers to perform larger and more meaningful tasks. And leadership styles of empowerment, consultation and participation are most evident. You then have the matrix approach, the most appropriate structure for a given situation, and that will depend on a number of factors, but most organisations exist in a changing environment, so have to retain flexibility to survive. So the grid or matrix structure emerged um, in the 1950s 
when its customers become frustrated at having to deal with a number of functional specialists when negotiated defense contracts. It came from Lockheed, the American aerospace company. And the essence of the matrix structure is dual reporting. So individuals report to a line manager for supervision and human resources issues, but they also report to a project manager for all aspects of work, timescales and targets and teamwork. And lastly, the hybrid structure. This is the approach and organizational structure where they combine the best of functional with the flexibility of the matrix. It allows the advantages of each form of organization to be leveraged in appropriate and flexible ways, depending on a mix of customers, contracts and technologies. But it can also incorporate regional differences where geographical areas of the company may be responsible for different regions of customers or products. And that is the end of learning outcome three. Thank you for watching.